Are you evil? Somebody. Yes, former KGB officer. Deliberately did such an evil thing. Murder was afoot. Source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. In the Pacific Northwest, along the southern coast of British Columbia, lies the picturesque Strait of Georgia. This will be the stage for the gruesome discoveries of seven disarticulated human feet. All of these feet, encased in running shoes, will be given over to the authorities over a period of two years. This case will baffle the authorities and scientists for years to come and will capture the interest of the international press. On August 20th, 2007, a young girl and her family are visiting British Columbia. On the beach of Jedediah Island, a girl notices several running shoes. She picks one up. Pulling on the sock that is still inside, she is surprised to see that it contains a human foot. She calls out to her family who immediately alert the police. In these coastal regions, civil protection is provided by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who treat these cases as any other suspicious matter. Annie Linto is the RCMP spokesperson. Obviously, we arrive on the scene. We use the laboratory for forensic identification. They search the scene and write a report. They take photographs and video of the scene. Then our investigators also search along the shore and talk to witnesses, etc. But the police do not find another foot or the body of a victim who could help them understand how the foot has wound up there. Less than a week later, about 50 kilometers south on Gabriola Island, a couple is on a hike along the ocean. Suddenly, they notice a running shoe with the laces still tied. They turn it up and see a bone sticking out of the shoe. the couple immediately called the police. At a press conference, the RCMP report what little they know at the time. There were two right feet found, and both are in men's size 12 running shoes. According to the investigators, the probability of finding two feet of the same size is very low. The police invite the public to contact them if they have any information concerning the case. The story spreads quickly through the media and the imagination of the public explodes. Questions arise. Who did the feet belong to? Why did they end up on these islands? How did they become separated from the rest of the body? Are they linked to a single event? A plane crash, or a boating accident perhaps? Or worse, could they be victims of a crime whose bodies have been cut up and thrown in the water? We received about a dozen calls, but they were mostly theories about what they thought might have happened. People seem to have a morbid fascination as to the origin of these feet. The first thing we must do is to identify the victim. It's the first step. Then the identification will show us a bit more whether or not we must pursue a criminal investigation. The RCMP transfer the two right feet to the BC coroner's office. The office is responsible for a completely different aspect of this investigation and tries by various scientific means to extract the maximum amount of information from these mysterious feet. The police departments are involved in a, a fault-finding process. They're looking for uh, criminal activity, 
they're investigating the potential of a crime, whereas the coroner's service are involved in a fact-finding investigation. So we're responsible not only for the identification of the, of the decedent, but also when they died, where they died, how they died, and by what means. We classify that death as either natural, um, uh, suicide, accident, homicide, or undetermined. If you've only got a foot, why is it that you only have a foot? And the pathologist can sometimes help with that by determining whether there's any evidence of trauma, if there's any uh, mechanical removal of that foot from the rest of the body. When a foot is found in a shoe on the beach, you know, there's not a lot that we know about it immediately. And we certain that's what the investigation is all about. And from there on, we'd use a number of different experts. An anthropologist might be really valuable. Um, there might, you know, there may be bugs within the sock. You know? So if there's insects, perhaps an entomologist might be useful to help us. How quickly a body decomposes depends on where it is and the types of organisms that attack it. The coroner enlists the services of Dr. Gail Anderson, who researches human decomposition. I've been working in forensic entomology now for over 20 years, and whenever I speak to police officers, uh, I've been able to show the kind of research I do and how it works in a, an actual homicide investigation. But they would always ask, yes, but what happens when a body's in the water? And it became very frustrating not to be able to answer that question. So we started looking at uh, carcasses, animal carcasses, first of all in fresh water, and then now more recently in the marine environment. We've always used pig carcasses in forensic entomology. They're considered to be a very good mimic for human decomposition. Obviously, it's much more difficult to, to use human bodies. So pig carcasses make a good replication for humans. Pigs are roughly the same size as the adult human torso. So this is where ma most of the decomposition is taking place in a human being, with the face and the head and, and the gut region. And so a pig, if we get the right size pig, roughly mimics that. My main interest in looking at bodies in water is to look at the animals that uh, scavenge or feed on the body. As a forensic entomologist on land, I look at the insects that colonize a body over time and use that to estimate how long that person's been dead. So in the water, I'm trying to do the same sort of thing, only there I'm not looking really at insects, I'm looking at their family members, They're the same sort of group, we're looking at the arthropods. So crabs, shrimp, things like that. We do know of situations where bodies, we know they only went into the water a few days before and they're almost skeletonized when we find them. Uh, that's one of the problems of the ocean. When you look at research on land, you can say, well, research conducted in this area is going to be very similar to research conducted in this area because geographically they're very similar, they've got the same kind of plants, meteorological conditions and things. But in the ocean, the, the situation changes within a few meters. In my shallow experiments, I found that carcasses that rotted on rock were very different from those that rotted on sand, even a few meters apart. The coroner's office also enlists the services of a DNA expert to gain insight on this strange case. Well, once the autopsy is complete, that's when we look at extracting a DNA sample. That sample would be submitted to a lab, and they may have to try a number of times to actually generate a profile. Um, just because we have a sample doesn't mean we're going to get DNA. Um, there's a big challenge with developing DNA profiles from degraded remains. Investigators call in the Department of Forensic Science at the BC Institute of Technology. Moisture can be detrimental to DNA because it does facilitate the growth of microbes, bacteria, and fungus. So it just allows those things to infiltrate a sample and excrete these enzymes called nucleases, which is what degrades the DNA and makes it unusable. But as you decompose, that uh, soft tissue will break down. And along that, along with that, would be the, the breakdown of the DNA. So um, what you want to do is go after the hard tissues in a, in a difficult case, because the hard tissue lasts longer and therefore protects the DNA inside the hard tissue. Retesting is something we have to do if we're not successful the first time around. So sometimes we'll go back and get a larger sampling of the bone, because DNA doesn't uh, degrade consistently throughout the body. Some bones may have nothing. Other bones may still have a trace of DNA. While specialists examine the feet for clues to their origins, the RCMP begin looking at events that could have caused the death of the victims. They start with all accidents over the past years that occurred in or around the water on the south coast of British Columbia. Mais également, on a regardé 
But we also looked at all incidents, like boats that may have sunk or maybe planes that crashed. One incident in particular is that in 2005, there was a plane crash at Quadra Island. And it is assumed that the passengers were killed and were never found. In 2005, five men board a float plane for what should be a routine trip to a logging camp up the BC coast. They take off from Camel River in the morning mist and are never heard from again. For two days, volunteers and authorities search by boat and helicopter, but find nothing. On the third day, the body of only one of the passengers washes up on Quadra Island. Five months later, the plane is recovered from 240 meters underwater. Sadly, the pilot and the three other passengers are not on board. Two years after the plane crash, the families of the missing men hear about the feet washing ashore only 100 kilometers away. Their hopes are sparked and they eagerly give DNA samples to the RCMP and anxiously await the results. They'll be compared with the profiles from the found remains. Well, we know that in your DNA profile, we have to see a match to your mom and dad. Now, if we use your brother or sister, statistically, you're more likely to share components, but you don't have to. So it makes it a lot more difficult to use siblings, particularly if you've only got one sibling. It can get a little bit better if you have multiple siblings, because you can put all the information together. Will the test results show a connection between the feet found on Jedediah and Gabriola Islands and the victims of the crash? In August 2007, in British Columbia's Strait of Georgia, tourists make two separate discoveries of running shoes containing human right feet. Only 50 kilometers separate the two islands where the gruesome discoveries are made. The RCMP and the coroner's office collaborate. They rely on many experts to help them explain the discoveries. On February 8, 2008, two foresters find another right foot buried in a running shoe. This shocking discovery is on Valdez Island, about 10 kilometers from Gabriola Island, where the second foot was found. That makes three men's right feet in less than six months. After the discovery of the second foot, we were a little curious. Maybe it was a coincidence. But after the third, we were very curious. It is a bit strange. So the police started an investigation that was a little bit more integrated. But it's not unusual to find, find incomplete body parts. I mean, that is not something that, you know, that, that would shock us. Many. We found with the unit specifically that I manage, we have up to 60% of our cases that are incomplete. So finding incomplete bodies is not unusual. It's just that these feet and shoes were found in a short span of time. The public is anxious to know the identity of the remains. Speculations continue to rise. Do the feet belong to the victims of the Quadra Island plane crash? or do they belong to victims of a completely different accident? The coroner has determined that there is no evidence of trauma or mechanical removal of the feet from the rest of the body. So how do the feet become disembodied? It's a very natural uh, situation for the body to disarticulate as it breaks down. First of all, uh, through the scavenging of the tissue that holds you together, then eventually by breaking up the cartilage, eating the cartilage, and, and completely disarticulating the body. If any of those body parts are attached to something that's a natural flotation device, like for instance a running shoe, uh, then it would be quite natural for it to rise to the surface, just like your bloated body would, and then potentially with the tides and currents be washed ashore. 
spite of these facts, the investigators need to know when the victims died and were put in the water. But water can influence decomposition of a body in many ways. Well, water temperature certainly affects the, the decomposition of the body in water, as it does on land. And in general, the water temperature is a lot cooler, and certainly it is here in the, the Vancouver region. Our temperatures are consistently around about 9 degrees Celsius, so that's quite cool. So that can slow down decomposition because it slows down the bacterial action. The running shoes play an intriguing role in the discovery of the feet. The rubber soles of the runners act as floats to keep the feet adrift and protects them from scavenging birds and the UV rays of the sun. Once the, the joint is disarticulated, then the, the foot is now free to perhaps float to the surface. And in particular, if the foot is in a light running shoe, we've all seen the, the trend over the last decade of shoes getting lighter and lighter, in particular running shoes, that these, the, the feet would be protected uh, and possibly float to the surface. If the density of the shoe is, is light enough, it'll stay at the surface forever. Because the feet are in an advanced state of decomposition, it's likely they spent a long time in water. Given that state of decomposition and the probable contamination of the feet, it may not be possible to obtain complete DNA samples. As the technology becomes more and more sensitive, it becomes easier and easier to contaminate that sample. So anybody who comes into contact with that bone, for example, may contaminate it with their own sample just by touching it, breathing on it, sneezing on it. So it's contamination control is a key concern and one of the reasons why it takes long to get uh, DNA from these, uh, these samples. Well, there's different ways to clean samples. You can sand it, you can rinse it with uh, water and ethanol, and we actually expose all of the samples before we pulverize them to really intense UV light. Bleach is actually a, a cheap and effective way to decontaminate uh, your evidence. So you can get rid of the DNA that you don't want being able to obtain DNA samples remains the foundation of the investigation. Once the victim is identified, we'll be able to see their history. That is, whether the person was out fishing, were they out on a boat? They might have fallen into the water, or is it that the person might be involved in organized crime, in a gang, etc.? It is the mandate of the coroner's office to determine if a death occurred due to natural causes, suicide, or homicide. In a case such as the mysterious feat, that represents a big challenge. It's not just relying on what the pathologist can advise, but also what the scene's telling you, what the history has indicated. We know of many accidents. You know, there are plane crashes, there are, there are boating incidents. We know of mis many missing people that we prioritize. Um, because there is always a potential that that person may have been brought by various currents and other ways to that particular point where, they were, where the feet were recovered. The high suicide rate is an important consideration in solving this mystery. Vancouver is located along the Fraser River and has a number of very high bridges that link the north and south shores. Over the decades, many people have chosen to end their lives by jumping to their death from these bridges. Another question is whether or not the feet could be linked to the cases of missing men in Metro Vancouver. Many of these men disappeared in or close to water. One of these missing men is John Kaler. His truck was found near Stave Lake, which flows into the Fraser River. The truck was running with the door open the radio and the windshield wipers were on, and his cell phone was on the seat. In the course of our investigation, we reviewed all of the missing persons files in the province. Then they were prioritized. And then these files were given to investigators to try to see if we could find additional clues.
but the mystery of the disembodied feet remains intact. Investigators compare the evidence they have gathered to the database of missing persons looking for leads. But this is not as easy as it sounds. I can uh, give you a, a sense of how difficult this, uh, this problem is when a foot washes up on shore. Um, you have to understand that there are approximately 200 sets of unidentified remains that the, that the BC Coroner Service has. We don't know who they are. And there's approximately 2,000 missing people reported in the province of BC alone. So it's a matter of matching up these 200 unidentifieds to 2,000 missing persons. There isn't DNA done on all of these samples yet. So when you throw a, a single bone or a single found foot into this mix, uh, it's a huge problem to solve. The DNA comparisons alone could add months, even years, to the investigator's quest for the facts. But will their efforts be rewarded with a match? Within six months, three disembodied men's right feet are found inside running shoes. They were found on three separate islands in the Strait of Georgia, British Columbia. Theories are multiplying. Were these victims of suicide, boating or marine accidents, or maybe the growing number of gang-related murders? Some people believe the feet may belong to victims of a plane crash near Quadra Island two years earlier. Since then, the wrecked plane has been recovered. There were no passengers on board. The seatbelts were not attached, suggesting that the victims escaped before the crash. The family's only hopes lie in the results from their DNA comparisons. Now that the bones from the feet have been cleaned, they can begin to extract samples used to create genetic profiles process of getting DNA is actually, as, as good as the technology is today, is still a fairly labor-intensive process to get DNA from something like a bone sample. They have to carefully pulverize the sample right down to almost the consistency of flour to maximize the access to the remnants of DNA that were trapped all throughout that sample. The way we do it is to use what's called a cryogenic grinder. So we put it inside a sealed sterile chamber with a metal impactor. And that goes inside a special instrument that's immersed in liquid nitrogen. And then that steel impactor goes back and forth and pulverizes that sample at very low temperatures. So we take that sample and we do a quantification on it to see if there's human DNA there. And if there is, then we go to the third step and that's amplification. Use a, using a technique called polymerase chain reaction that allows you to amplify the regions of interest for identification. We call that an electropherogram but it's just easier to say it's a DNA profile. It looks like, on a piece of paper, uh, a series of colored peaks. And those colored peaks, as I mentioned before, will, can be uh, transposed into a series of unique numbers. Besides the human remains, the only other pieces of evidence are the runners. What can investigators discover from the shoes? So we made inquiries with the manufacturers of the shoes to find out where the shoes were made, as well as where and when they were distributed, in an attempt to build a time frame of when the victims might have disappeared. There's a lot that shoes can't tell you. There's a production date for a shoe, for instance. So that provides you with sort of some sort of temporal parameters to look at. So you can start looking at missing people within a certain range of time. So there's a lot the shoes can provide. There's si shoe sizes, there's male and female shoes. Not that that's a definitive way to make an exclusion in terms of sex, but there is a lot of information on the shoe that can, that can certainly assist you with enhancing the profile of the individual who you believe to be deceased. Investigators gave the ID numbers found inside the shoes to the manufacturers, who told them where the shoes were made and distributed. Two of the runners were sold in North America, while the third one was sold in India. This information gives investigators a way to refine their search. The long process of creating genetic profiles for the three feet is complete. 
but that is only the first step in the identification process. Once you get a DNA profile from that, all that tells you is the sex of the individual. Unless you have something to compare it to, it's really of no use. So the next, the next half of the investigation is to find something to compare to. They begin the difficult task of reviewing hundreds of files of missing persons using the criteria they have gathered, such as sex, dates of production for the runners, location, and date of when they were last seen alive. From those results, a list of people to whom the feed could belong to is produced. Relatives of the people on that list can then be contacted for samples of DNA to compare to the profiles made from the remains. So that comparison could be running it, running it against a database of known samples. It could be the investigator going out and speaking to the family and getting samples from the family to compare against. Or it could be going to the missing person's apartment and getting their toothbrush or razor to use as a, a source of known DNA for comparison. We have databases now that help us screen large numbers of profiles, but ultimately it's going to come down to an expert like myself that has to look at these two profiles from the phone and from some other source and may do a statistical calculation and come up with an expert opinion on whether or not this is the deceased person you think it is. While Dean Hildebrand compares results to the DNA database, the case of the unknown feet gets bigger. May 22, 2008, a man is walking his dog on Kirkland Island near the Vancouver airport. Kirkland is a small, uninhabited island in the Fraser River Delta. It is about 40 kilometers from Valdez Island, where the third foot was discovered three months earlier. A running shoe with a sock inside attracts the attention of his dog. The man looks inside the sock and discovers a human foot. This represents the fourth right foot in nine months. However, it's the first female foot. Is the fact that they are all right feet a coincidence? Speculations run high. The most outrageous and diverse theories erupt. Is it the work of a serial killer whose calling card is right feet? Do these feet belong to victims of drownings in the Pacific Ocean? Could they belong to the victims of the Quadra plane crash? Maybe they belong to some of the thousands of missing persons in British Columbia. Will the genetic comparisons provide an answer to these questions? ever-growing number of disembodied feet have been found in the Strait of Georgia, British Columbia. The discoveries stun the public and baffle authorities. The families of the victims of a plane crash, as well as those of dozens of missing men, anxiously await the results of the genetic comparisons with the feet. If the female victim has lived in British Columbia for a while, the chances of identification are better than for male victims because of the work done by the BC Cancer Agency. The closest thing to a repository we have for potential known samples of DNA would be the BC Cancer Agency who keeps pap smears on file for obviously half of our population that has pap smears done. Um, and we've actually used pap smears to identify skeletonized remains uh, in, in the past. And a lot of investigators, well, it's getting better now, they know that. But uh, those, those, those slides can be kept for many, many years, and they're known sources, they're medical samples from half our population. But none of the PAP tests in the bank lead to an identification of a female foot. June 16, 2008, a couple is out for a walk on Westham Island in Delta, British Columbia. Floating on the water along the shore, they discover the fifth foot in less than a year. The island lies less than one kilometer from Kirkland Island, where the fourth discovery took place, so one might expect the feet to match. This foot belongs to a man, just like the other three feet, but it is the first left foot. There's something very strange about either right feet or, or the source. Um, in some sense, it was a bit of a, a relief when a left foot showed up as well. From a scientific perspective at the moment, I don't think we 
would speculate that right feet have any special characteristic over left feet. Um, it's just the, the, the way things worked out. The investigation reveals that one of the shoes was sold in India. This raises the questions, where did these feet come from and how did they get into the Strait of Georgia? The investigators turn to the oceanographic community to help unravel the mystery. Dr. Richard Dewey has his own theory. We do not believe they've come from the open ocean and ended up washing up on our shores. The, the oceanographic dynamics do not support that hypothesis. So in that sense, we can constrain the investigation to really being a local investigation. Georgia Strait is quite separated, and the flow at the surface, where these feet would have done most of their traveling, is outwards, out to the Pacific Ocean. So it's unlikely uh, we're looking at a remote source. They're probably local. But knowing that the feet are from this region does not do much to help the investigation. The Fraser River is 1,375 kilometers long, and the Strait of Georgia has an area of 6,800 square kilometers. That's more than 100 times the area of the island of Manhattan, an enormous area to investigate. So there's a lot of circulation patterns that are going on at the same time, and Strait of Georgia is a very large basin, and it's influenced by primarily tidal motion. The outflow of the Fraser River into the Strait of Georgia is enormous and has a significant effect on the surface current. And all that fresh water flows into the Strait of Georgia and influences the circulation. So the Fraser River plume accentuates the circulation that would go around the inlet or around the basin and cause things to perhaps circulate for weeks or months and spread things out. With the investigation covering such an extensive territory, determining the exact location of these feet is almost impossible. The number of possible scenarios is so high that it's difficult to narrow down the research. Um, it may seem surprising that these feet are found at very different beaches, but in reality, if you, if you threw in a, a bunch of wood chips, the same thing would happen. You'd get wood chips eventually showing up on all the shores. The results are finally in. Unfortunately, the DNA from the feet does not match any of the samples given by the families of the plane crash victims or the families of the missing men in British Columbia. The investigation has made some progress, but it's not exactly what everyone expected. They have found that the third foot and the fifth foot belong to the same man. The curious thing about these feet is the fact that they were washing up, not all together, um, but spread out around the entire Strait of Georgia uh, geographically and spread out over a long period of time. Um, it turns out that two of the feet from the same body washed up on different shores months apart. The feet may come up weeks apart or they may come up very close together. Um, if they come up uh, weeks apart, they will enter different sort of circulations. As they come up, they may encounter different wind conditions, for example, dip come up at different times of the season. But even if they came up together relatively close to the same time, the circulation patterns are complex enough that things would get separated over timescales of days to weeks. And the wind eventually blows things up onto the shore, the wave action and wind action. So eventually, flotsam that floats on the surface will eventually end up on the shore. And so the, it's perhaps not too surprising that uh, even feet from different bodies, but certainly the same body, ended up on opposite shores, separated by several months. Another question that puzzles investigators is, what happened to the bodies of the four victims? Gail Anderson studies decomposition using the world's most advanced ocean research technology, the Venus Ocean Observatory. When you're doing my kind of research in the ocean, uh, accessibility is the main problem. Obviously, you need to have cameras down there, you need divers, you need boats. And this becomes very limiting financially, but also safety-wise. I can't put carcasses at very great depths if I'm using human beings to go down. And obviously, there's a limited amount of time that people can spend down there and how often they can go down. Venus eliminates all of those problems by having a remote camera on the bottom of the ocean that I can control from a laptop anywhere in the world. Richard Dewey is the Associate Director of Research for the Venus Project at the University of Victoria. 
Basically, the infrastructure that uh, makes up the observatory is a, a shore station which provides power and communications to the subsea components, what we call a node. And the node is an underwater hub, if you like. It's where we plug I instruments in, they get power, and they get Ethernet connection back to the shore station. So the, the marine cable and the node provide us with a, the, the permanent infrastructure sitting on the bottom. And then we lower down instrument packages plug them into the node, and they're live on the internet and back here to the university where we log the data. Our primary uh, set of researchers are ocean scientists and uh, oceanographers, marine geologists, uh, people that it would typically be associated with marine research. But by uh, once we installed the observatory and uh, the, the word got out there that we had this facility feeding uh, data streams over the web, we were contacted by a variety of scientists that are outside the marine science environment. We have uh, Gail Anderson with forensics. We have a variety of computing science and engineering uh, scientists that have contacted us. They're interested in advanced systems or they're interested in complex data. Gail Anderson experiments using pig carcasses. They're an ideal replica for humans because they are omnivores, relatively hairless, and roughly the same size as the adult human torso. In my first carcass with Venus at 100 meters, uh, a shark took out a large chunk of flesh on the second day. And that open area became a major site of almost all the activity. All the crabs, the shrimp, everything came to that area. In the second carcass, uh, we didn't get a shark attack until about two weeks into the decomposition. And there, all the activity was centered around the gut region, where decomposition was taking place with bacterial action. And the large crabs were able to rip open that gut area, and the smaller animals were able to get in. A third pig carcass has been placed at a much lower depth. In the third carcass, it was a lot lower oxygen levels, so a lot of the larger animals, like crabs, couldn't get to the bodies. There, there was almost no damage to the pig for several months until the oxygen increased. The carcasses were pretty much scavenged of any uh, tissue by about 21, 23 days after I placed them at 100 meters. Uh, a lot longer time, actually, at the shallower depths. But uh, to actually see the bones completely separated and, and no cartilage left, it's about 40 to 43 days under these circumstances. Regardless of the depth the victim sank to, it's probable that there was an onslaught of living organisms attacking the body. It's likely that the running shoes protected the feet and floated them to the surface. On June 18th, 2008, another foot in a running shoe is found on Tai Spit, located near Quandra Island. The shoe is given to the coroner's office, who quickly determines that the discovery is a fake. An examination by a pathologist establishes that jokers have stuffed the shoe with an animal paw, much to the despair of the families of the plane crash victims. The coroner now has five feet belonging to four unidentified victims. Do these people have something in common? Are they victims of the same accident? or the prey of a sinister murderer. In a period of 10 months, five human feet have been discovered encased in running shoes. They have been found on the shores of the Fraser River and islands of the Strait of Georgia in British Columbia. For the sixth time, the families of the missing persons and plane crash victims have had their hopes shattered. What appeared to be a sixth foot turned out to be a cruel hoax. You know, when you, when you stage a hoax like that and you take all the investigative resources and time to attend a scene, to process a case, that time could have been committed to making an identification on another case, uh, bringing, bringing closure to this family. It's, it's really devastating to the family because as soon as they hear of, of another human remains case found, they're all waiting for, you know, they're waiting for that call, they're expecting the worst. It puts families under tremendous amount of pressure. Authorities are still baffled. Investigators have not been able to put an identity to any of the human remains, and they have not found any evidence to link these remains to a crime. On July 10th, 2008, about a year after the discovery of the first foot, the authorities hold another press conference. They present the new information they have, pictures of the running shoes, information on when and where the shoes were made, and where they were distributed. 
So it's really important for us to utilize the media as, a, an, as an investigative tool to get very um, important pieces of information, some of those enhanced detailed uh, characteristics um, out into the community so that hopefully someone recognizes them and can, can associate that with somebody who's missing from their community, from their family. The investigators also want to take the opportunity to educate the public. They ask Dean Hildebrand to attend the conference. He talks about the limitations of the standardized test used for forensic DNA analysis called STR, or short tandem repeats. There's a lot of information in our DNA, obviously. I mean, the, our DNA will dictate what race we are. It will dictate our skin tones, our eye colors, hair colors. So that information is there. However, the DNA that we target for forensics, these STRs, all they do is tell you the sex. They don't, they're not good indicators of race. They don't tell you eye color, hair color, stature, anything like that. There is work being done in this field to try and uh, uh, tease out that information about uh, perhaps the racial uh, origins of, of uh, a sample, a DNA sample, a set of remains. There's also common questions from police when they have a, a blood stain at a crime scene, for example. What can you tell me about the offender? We don't know anything about the person who left this. Um, obviously, we can tell the male or female, but can you tell me what skin color, what eye color, what hair color? That information is theoretically there, but it's not routine yet, getting access to that information. The press conference generates dozens of leads. One family recognizes the first shoe and wonders if it belongs to one of their missing family members. Full of hope, they call the authorities and offer information. The investigators achieve their first real breakthrough. They gave us a DNA sample and the resulting profile has allowed us to identify the first foot as belonging to a person who was missing from the metro area of Vancouver. The information they told us was that the person was emotionally unstable. We have made one identification, which has been very important, obviously, to the family, and also important because we can get a sense of the circumstances and the uh, issues surrounding that death. On October 21st, 2008, another discovery is made by a kayaker, but this time, it's not a shoe. It's the body of John Kaler, floating in Stave Lake nearly one year after he went missing. His feet are intact. Then, on November 11, 2008, while out for a walk near Finn Slough along the Fraser River, a couple finds a blue and white running shoe. It contains a size 7 left foot belonging to a woman. The coroner's office matches the sixth foot to the fourth foot found six months earlier on Kirkland Island, located directly across the Fraser River. This discovery brings the case to six feet belonging to four people. We get about 7,500 to 7,700 cases reported to the coroner service every year. Of that, we probably end up at the end of the year with maybe five to 10 at the most, um, where we're still struggling to make an identification. If we look at all of our cases that date back as far as the 60s, we only have 200 unidentified human remains cases. So, so long as those human remains remain unidentified, we have to continue investigating. And, you know, I think the family should feel confident that we're doing everything that we can. We've used the type of tech, all the latest types of technology that we can to enhance the profiles. And hopefully, all of this effort will come, you know, will be rewarded with an identification. On October 27th, 2009, Two men walking along the Fraser River, a few kilometers upstream from the last three discoveries, find the seventh foot to wash ashore in British Columbia in two years. The investigation of the disembodied feet continues. These cases are not closed, as long as the victims have not been identified. So they could stay open forever. But one thing is certain is that before these incidents, I think that often people found or saw shoes along the beaches 
and most people kept walking. Now, I think that, and this includes myself, I think if now we walk along a beach, along a shoreline, and you see a shoe, you'll probably stop and then look inside. The waters of the Fraser River and the Strait of Georgia still hold their secrets. Maybe one day, another clue will wash ashore and reveal the identities of the disembodied feet of British Columbia.